my name is Matt Kopchak. I'm the Vice President of Management with Worth Ross. Uh, I wanted to thank you all again for joining us for what is now our, our second uh, Master Speaker Series webinar. Uh, like last time, the focus of these events is on preparing our HOA boards for the challenges and uncertainties and opportunities that uh, the associations are faced with. <clears throat> uh, before we get too far into the event tonight, I just want to let everyone know that we are recording this again, and we will make it available to our board members and our team members, uh, just like we did on the other videos that, uh, that were part of this webinar series. Uh, we just want to make sure that everyone has the resources we need, even if they weren't unable to attend, we're happy to share those. So uh, with all of that being said, um, I'll introduce our event for tonight, which is Ensuring Homeowner, Homeowner and Condominium Associations. Our speaker and presenter for tonight is Rod Medlin from Scarborough Medlin and Associates. Um, and in this webinar tonight, Rob will be sharing some strategies and insights, various tools and resources that HOAs and their boards can use uh, as it relates to risk and insurance. So in just a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Rod for his presentation. Uh, and with that, the flow and format of this will be a little bit different than the last one. Uh, I, um, you'll see Rod's presentation on the screen and he will talk through it. If anyone has any questions at all throughout the night, uh, you can either chat those directly to me. My name is Matt, or you can uh, raise your hand and we can communicate kind of offline in the chat window and I will present those questions to Rod either at the end or if they're, they're relevant uh, given the topic that Rod's currently talking about. So. Uh, with that said, Rod, if you want to get started. Okay. Uh, Matt, I appreciate it. I appreciate the, the opportunity that I've been offered to do this. Uh, I have been in the commercial insurance business for, uh, this will be my 38th year. Uh, and for the past 30 years, uh, we have practiced association insurance. And association insurance is unique. Uh, it's very unique. As a matter of fact, most agencies do very little, if any. Uh, we do a tremendous volume. We have uh, over 1,100 uh, clients with, uh, with homeowners associations, and they range uh, in size from a small gated community that might pay 3000 a year all the way up to the big ones, which pay uh, closer to a quarter of a million in a lot of cases. Uh, the, in that practice, we also focus on uh, garden style, mid-rise and high-rise condominiums. And for the past 30 years, I've probably written as many or more high-rise condominiums in Dallas, Texas as anybody else in the business. Uh, so I've been doing this a long time through good markets, through bad markets, uh, and have been here in practice since 81. Now, uh, if you go to the first, to the second page of my slide, let's see here. Uh, basically, we have coverage, uh, property coverage. We have GL coverage. Uh, everybody's got that that owns property and has premises. Uh, then we have DNO and Fidelity, which are unique to association boards, nonprofit boards. Uh, we have a hired non-own, we have work comp, which may or may not uh, apply to you. Uh, we have umbrella for excess limits, and then we have uh, coverage in place that will trigger in the event that some COVID-19 coverage is found. At this point, none of our carriers are willing to make a position or a position known on COVID. And the reason is because it is an un uninsurable peril that we have never seen before. Uh, you've got to figure as a thinking individual in business that someone will find a way because for instance, if this party was in person and we invited a hundred people and in a week, a hundred people were sick, we need to have some kind of coverage somewhere. I don't know where that will come from right now. I have prepared and sent a complete review of COVID and COVID protection measures, which you can take. And I've sent it to Nicole, who will distribute it. It's done by Joel Mex uh, Meskin. Joel Meskin is an attorney with McGowan and Companies. And he, is, he writes the DNO forms. We rely on him heavily and his practice is limited to the kind of coverages that we're talking about here for you. 
So uh, if you'll take a look at Joel's uh, video conference that I sent, it's only a few minutes and it will help you understand that subject. Uh, next slide. Okay, the things that we typically insure the property and, and real and improvements of any kind of minimum association. Uh, in a small HOA, that can be simply an amenity center or a pool house. Uh, in your case, in many cases, you have, uh, I insure one high rise condominium here in Dallas that is uh, 760,000 square feet with a 59,000 square foot roof. And that's about a $130 million property. And, and that's about as big as a high rise condo gets. There are some that have been built like in Austin, Sea Home and some others that are bigger. But for the most part, you're gonna find that the Bonaventure located in North Dallas is gonna be up about the biggest. Uh, so there we have a lot of considerations to make. Next slide, if you could, please. Uh, the first thing that's on everybody's list is replacement cost. We have to insure everything that we insure for you for replacement cost. That simply means new for old, uh, no depreciation, like kind, like quality, like materials. So we replace it in no accordance with uh, replacement cost valuation. Uh, there is an ACV, older associations who have impaired roofs sometimes have to accept ACV valuation, but the way we, we smooth it all over is the application of an agreed amount endorsement so either way we have it, uh, the carriers agreed previous uh, to the loss in the event of a loss, what they're gonna pay. The actual cash value, value is very simple math. Uh, roofs are devalued or uh, valued based on a 20 year life and that uh, depending on the year, you get that associated 5% percentage. So if it's 12 year old roof, uh, they're gonna give you uh, about 40%. So it's going to be left. So, uh, you know, under ACV, it's not safe. They'll call your loan. Your mortgage company will get upset. We don't have any way of making it go away. So that's one of the things that we work with. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see, co-insurance. You'll never see co-insurance on the policies you buy in most cases if you're a larger association or medium association. Uh, we take coinsurance out. Coinsurance is simply a sharing proportional to your under insurance, meaning if you insure a $10 million building for $8 million, you would only have 80% of the coverage you need. In the event of a $10,000 loss, they would only pay you 80% of the $10,000. Uh, we remove the coinsurance penalty altogether. That way we do not have to consider that. Uh, in the adjustment process. Uh, let's see, next slide, please. Okay, coinsurance explanation is on that slide right there. That will be available to you. The math's pretty easy. Coinsurance only applies, penalties only apply on partial losses, never on total losses. Texas is a, a value policy state in the event of a total loss, the insurance company will issue a check for the amount on the declarations. Next slide, please. Blanket limits used to be something that we always got. And it's important if you're a multi-building association rather than a high rise. We have mid rises that come in threes and fours and fives. Uh, and then we have average garden style associations Used to, we applied a blanket limit that allowed any value to move from any building to any other building in the event of mistakes and in the event of one or more buildings having more intrinsic value than originally scheduled. Today, they won't do that for us anymore. And I've actually uh, seen two lawsuits involving associations that were underinsured, severely, significantly, terribly underinsured. Uh, one of them you may remember, it was a condominium association, uh, which nestles between the Athena and the Preston Tower. And I insure both of them. 
And when this when this property burned two years ago, it was a plate line loss, one fatality. Uh, building was valued on the insurance at $9 million. Uh, when the loss was adjusted, the value of the building should have been $24 million. That cost the association their very existence. It got the people involved sued. It resulted in an insurance agency and property management company going completely out of business. And we didn't get any of the damages paid for in our adjacent properties. And that's something that we avoid. The way we avoid it is we look at values, something you should do, should do it every five years uh, in a mid-rise and you should do it every third year in a high rise. And we have people that provide us with valuations, but the limit should always be safe. And one of our primary charges is to make sure that we help guide you to a safe number, which is something we do concern ourselves with hap happily and very seriously. Uh, next one. Uh, property coverage deductibles. They have punished us before, uh, before the world for tornado and hail losses. Uh, last year we had losses in excess of 8 billion. Uh, they're bigger catastrophes than raking or penetrating hurricanes. Uh, they have done damage. We had one loss alone at Wiley ISD uh, that was $56 million. Uh, there's nothing you can do if you're an insurance company but scream and ride check, they've done that, but now they're all collectively tired. And so they've all collectively not gotten together in Zurich and not decided that the whole industry is going to a win and hell deductible percentage, which is now one or 2% in some cases. Uh, we can buy that, that win and hell deductible back. Uh, normally the question is asked, well, Rod, how much is a buyback? Well, it depends on the quality of the value of the building and the exposure. And big, big buildings, sometimes we can get 6% of the deductible is the premium. In most cases, the average number is 8%. So if you have a $150,000 uh, $150, deductible and you buy that down to $50,000, they're paying you back. Uh, uh, the difference being, of course, one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars to get from one hundred fifty to twenty-five, and for that they're going to probably charge us about sixteen thousand dollars if you do the math exactly and run eight percent against the value of the deductible. You're going to get that number. It is something that we have to negotiate with a lot. On that point, uh, we have various carriers. If you are a big, big property and your square footage of your roof exceeds uh, $25,000, we have a program, or 25,000 square feet, we have a program, as long as you're under 25,000, we can get wind deductibles down to 75,000, down to 100,000. We can get no water deductibles. But when the roof exceeds 25,000 square feet, that program is no longer accessible to us. So we have to go to our next markets and those are AFM and Great American. And both of those markets want 2%. And both of those markets want 50 or 100 water deductible. Uh, and high rise property and mid rise property does not burn. It floods and it washes away. And it's done by water and they're self-fulfilling prophecies. I am told that high rise condominiums will cease to exist because of adult diapers. So that's one of the points that we watch. Uh, next slide, please. Let's see, property coverage, we are accustomed to and skilled at working through any Fannie Mae and VHA loan requirements that you run into. They can be very dictatorial. And there are times we actually have to get on the phone with them, but it can be done and we do it frequently. Next slide. Okay, your GL cover basically covers your liability uh, as a result of property damage or bodily injury to others caused by your acts or omissions. There has to be an element of negligence present 
for your general liability to trigger. Uh, the negligence in the case of uh, board of directors can be failure to warn, uh, failure to provide adequate insurance. Uh, there are a lot of uh, exposures under uh, the general liability that, that fall to the feet of the board. And while we do ensure and protect ownership of the premises, uh, we also ensure and protect the board. We protect them further with the DNO. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the excess general liability, our primary limit is built kind of like a box. Our primary limit is a million dollars per occurrence, and we have a $2 million annual aggregate on that GL. Uh, there are some limitations under that form for, uh, for some other coverage extensions, which are designed to make problems go away. Uh, damaged premises rented to you, it's typical limits 100,000. Uh, medical expense unit, uh, the medical expense that can be extended forward under your GL to an invitee that comes to the property and becomes damaged, injured, uh, we can make a payment of up to $5,000 voluntarily. It's designed to avoid litigation. Next slide, please. Uh, we also include in there personal and advertising injury. We have a general aggregate, most will pay under the general liability is two million. Uh, associations have no real products exposure other than incidental products where you might serve food or have, uh, have somebody come in and serve drinks. So those limits, while there are not uh, something we're generally concerned with, uh, you do have host liquor under this policy. You also have wrongful eviction, wrongful termination, wrongful imprisonment, uh, libel, slander. Uh, and so there's quite a bit that falls into this basement. Next slide, please. We sell occurrence policies 15 years ago. I needed to explain the difference. I don't now. We don't have, uh, we have claims made on DNO policies. Uh, we do not have claims made on our occurrence policies for our GL, our auto, our employer's liability, or our property. Next slide. Uh, the GL, as I indicated, extends host liquor, assault and battery. Uh, in Texas, punitive damages must be uh, addressed by the court. If a judge tells us to pay them, we pay them. So we have uh, coverage in place as broad as we can locate it uh, to protect your interest. Let's see, DNO. DNO coverage is, is, it's called wrongful acts. That's exactly what it covers. DNO covers the board, the directors, the officers, and the volunteers for any wrongful act. That can be, uh, that can be an act of a mistake. It can simply be a wrongful decision. It can be something that you should have got counsel on uh, that maybe you didn't, but there is misfeasance, malfeasance, and nonfeasance. And in the event that any allegations are made of any directors, uh, the coverage triggers, it indemnifies, it defends each board member, uh, it includes the property management company, it includes spouses, previous board members. Uh, there are defense costs. Sometimes they erode at your primary million dollar limit. Sometimes they do not. We strive to keep the defense cost outside the limit. Uh, the other coverages that we have to have and that we demand in the case of an association, 90% uh, of claims against associations include non-monetary damages. Most DNO excludes non-monetary damages. Uh, in our case, we persuade the carrier in almost every case to include them. Uh, punitive damages are included if the court will allow it. Retroactive date is full prior acts. So we're a lot safer than we used to be when we used to have to carry retro dates. And I do have some old retro dates. I've got some back to the to the 80s, but in most cases now they've done away with that. So the DNO is pretty self-contained and pretty simple. 
Next slide. Okay, different policies for different coverages, fidelity and crime. Fidelity and crime is a coverage that you have to carry if we have it in place for you or if your agent has it in place for you, you carry it because your declarations and bylaws indicate that you should. You can make a decision to discontinue that practice, I am told, by some management companies, uh, but we, we usually conform and comply. Your true exposure is insured by Worth Ross or your management company, and that company provides high limits, very high limits. They have all the points of control. They have all the financial controls. My carriers love them. Uh, we do a million dollars of it alone with travelers, uh, and we do hundreds of thousands of dollars with other carriers like Liberty Mutual, Chubb, uh, and Great American. So uh, it's not very expensive. It is something that's required. You should always look at your insurance requirements um, under your tax and bylaws. We use them to guide us in every decision. Uh, next. Hired not owned is simply in place for the umbrella. Uh, umbrella policy requires three underlying coverages. It requires general liability, it requires employer's liability, and it includes auto liability. In this case, we pick up our auto liability under hired non-owned policy because we have no owned autos. Uh, so we do have a million dollars of auto, uh, liability coverage. We do have a million dollars worth of employer's liability coverage and two million dollars worth of uh, general liability coverage. Above that, we have an umbrella. Next slide, please. The umbrella picks up and carries forward. Sorry, Rod. There, went, much, uh, uh, there you go. Uh, one back. I believe it is. Yeah. I said umbrella at the top. Nope. Backwards. Let's go back. Hold on one second. I got it. <clears throat> You're on umbrella, right? Yes. Will, come here. Oh. That's my that's on me. There you go. Okay. All right. Uh as I just said, we have basic underlying limits. Million CSL combined single limit on the auto, two million annual aggregate on the GL, and a million on the employer's liability. On top of that, uh, the umbrella provides excess limits up to the policy uh, limit. Uh, in most cases, we carry five, 10, 15, or 25 million limits, depending on uh, the association and their buying habits and their risk-taking habits. I actually think 10 million is enough, but the limits are available and they're cheap. So we re recommend that it go higher. One of the unique things that we do uh, is we have DNO built into the umbrella, so we only have to buy the first million DNO where we used to buy 2 million and 5 million and 10 million and 15 million. Now we do it very tubular fashion. They offer very high limits, follow form, uh, it's safe coverage, experienced carriers. Uh, they're very good at what they do. So we have limits all the way up to 25 million in most cases, and you will be as safe as a prudent person could hope to be. Next slide. Okay, the, the marketplace for your insurance purposes is, is very good right now. The, the property marketplace is very bad. Uh, because we have been hard on uh, the carriers, they have decided to be hard on us. Uh, we're not seeing anything moving much in the DNO, maybe $500 one way or the other if you have claims. Uh, your workers' comp is normally picked up by your management company. In this case, it's Worth Ross. Uh, and with Worth Ross, I can tell you, we just don't have many losses. Uh, that's why he's able to keep the right place where he keeps it uh, for the work that, that he does for you. Uh, we do have the cyber liability in place. Worth carries uh, 
high limits in many areas. He carries fiduciary. He carries everything you would expect a management company to carry, and he does it in uh, with very highly invest rated carriers. So uh, any coverage problem that anybody has, we have coverage backed up, stacked up, and lined up from coast to coast. Uh, next, next slide, please. Hail storms are making us need need help desperately. Uh, right now, we don't have competitive property. We have the best I can do is I recently did a high rise with a seventy five thousand dollar wind deductible. Fortunately, it only had a twenty four thousand square foot roof. Uh, cost about a dime or twelve cents per hundred value. Uh, that's where the market is right now on high rises. Mid rises, the market is 15 to 20 cents. Uh, in some cases, it exceeds 20, uh, depending on the, the expanse of rooftops. Uh, the premiums have gone up and are continuing to. The carriers uh, have made the buybacks available, but this is a complete new purchase in most cases for the association. So we place a lot of them, but we try not to have to do it if there's a viable alternative with a deductible that can be budgeted by the association. This is something we, we are constantly on the lookout for. Next slide. Uh, uh, next slide. Okay. Nope, next slide. That's it. Okay. That's pretty much, I mean, that's pretty much it. If anybody has any questions I can cover, any multitude of questions that you might have, and we'd be happy to do that. So and we, I, we have a couple questions. I'm gonna, yes, sir. don't come through me. So uh, the, fir the first question we have is, what is the definition of an admitted carrier versus a non-admitted carrier? Okay. Uh, when we look at uh, insurance risk, we have two opportunities to treat it. We have standard admitted, and we have non-standard non-admitted carriers. The difference being two things. State of Texas does not regulate uh, non-admitted surplus lines carriers, and they also do not participate in the state guarantee fund. The guarantee fund provides marginal protection for consumers in the event of an insurance company's failure. Generally, the guarantee fund, which pays on GL and auto claims, uh, will not pay over about 25% of of uh, the expense of, of loss. So what we have to do is be prepared uh, at any time uh, to, let me see here. Okay, Matt, what was I, the question was what again? The question uh, was, what is the definition of an admitted carrier? Yeah, sorry, right, back, sorry about that, lost my train of thought. No yeah, worries. the admitted carriers, we have to go to them first. And, and then we have to be able to show the uh, State Department of Insurance that we tried to get placements made with standard admitted carriers. But their, their volume of premium is horrible. They're, I mean, you go take a property that I write with, uh, with AFM or with Amtrust uh, for 20 cents, you take that to a standard company, they're going to want 60. We can't sell the rights. So we have to go to the competitive rights. To do that, we go to the non-standard, non-admitted market. The only difference is they have to show their tax separately and they are not participants in the guarantee fund, but they have rate, complete rate freedom. So we're able to negotiate to the market with them. And it's a tool we use almost every day. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next the next question is related to uh, limits. So, on the different policies, you can have different limits. And are those per occurrence? Or are they in aggregate? Uh, like, can you walk us through that again? Um, if you have a ten, go ahead. On a ten million dollar umbrella. Sure. Okay, a typical high rise that carries a ten million dollar umbrella is going to have a one million slash two million GL. Uh, they're going to have a hired non-owned auto policy with a $1 million limit, and then they're going to have a work comp, uh, minimum premium policy with a uh, million dollar limit. On top of those, 
I will uh, set a $10 million umbrella. So at the end of the day, you have 12 million in total limits on your GL, 11 million on your auto, and you have 11 million on your employer's liability. So in the event of, and you have then 11 million on your D and O. So that umbrella takes you up another 10 million by following the forms of the underlying coverages. And we structure that like a box. We don't let any light leak in or out of the box. All the coverage limits flush up to each other and follow form. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, next question is related to workers comp. So uh, earlier you had indicated that we as the management company, Worth Ross, carry workers comp, but in some cases it's also carried at the association level but most associations don't have employees, they're employees of the management company. So how does that, what is that coverage protecting and why, why do you see it as necessary? Well, in Texas, uh, the Texas Work Comp Commission, uh, we, we have trial de novo, but you have to meet certain state requirements to be able to get out of the purview of the Texas Work Comp Commission. And the Texas Work Comp Commission is very friendly to the, the injured worker and they seek a way to get claims paid. And so what we have to do in the event, uh, let's see here. The Dex and bylaws do not want the property impaired with lawsuits. Workers compensation is called the exclusive remedy. The exclusive remedy means that if you carry work comp, no one can sue you for anything as an employee other than workers' compensation benefits. Uh, we restrict, they restrict the coverage to, uh, to it. And then let's see here. The Dex and bylaws identify it, even though it's satisfied in the contract, uh, most people go ahead and carry it per the decks and bylaws. I've been told by another management company who does not put it in place and also do not put crime or fidelity in place that it can be uh, eliminated by board vote. I don't know. I would not be comfortable doing that. That is not reasonable and prudent. If your decks and bylaws say that you have to have it, we're going to follow those instructions until you alter those instructions. So do you have an example of a claim that was against the HOA's workers' comp? I do, I do. Uh, early years, I insured the Holiday Inn restaurants all across Texas, including all of the Holodomes. Uh, and over in Odessa, Texas, and I've had this same situation happen two times in high-rise associations, uh, they decided to hire uh, a contractor really, really cheap uh, to stripe the parking lots and update the parking lots. And so when they did it, they hired a couple of guys, they had a striping machine. They came out and did all the work. 10 days later, we get a claim in. Uh, we're advised by Texas Work Comp Commission. Uh, we have a guy with uh, loss of vision and he's alleging he's an employee uh, and he lost his eyesight due to uh, fumes from the paint. Uh, well, he was not a Holiday Inn employee or a Holiday Home employee. Uh, but the courts found him to be so because the Texas Work Comp Commission uh, agreed that that's the way it should be. So we indemnified and defended uh, the Holodome against this claim, ultimately not paying the claim, uh, but at least we had unlimited defense. We had benefits had the court found that he's an employee. So in the absence of that uh, buffer between you and your employee that Worth Ross offers, uh, there are times that claims can leak in by accident uh, where all he needed to prove his claim was a canceled check that said Holodome and we were on the hook. So that can happen to any association and it's not infrequent that it does. So we have that policy there. If that happens, we got coverage just like he, has, just like he was an employee and for that we pay 250 a year. Okay, uh, thank you. So the next the next topic question uh, to cover is on as it relates to bidding out insurance proposal. Uh, 
insurance proposals, right? So on a yearly basis, there seems to be the question, the question is, you know, we're often asked to get more than one bid on an insurance renewal, right? And you as the broker, sometimes uh, it's a challenging position, right? Can you kind of walk us through that process and why that's not, it's not handled in the same manner as it would be if you were bidding out for a landscape renewal uh, as an right. Well, the reason that things are a little bit different in your case is because number one, an association practice is not a, a common uh, occurrence within an agency. There are people that write condos, they probably write HOAs, uh, but they don't write them nearly on the volume that we do. And because of that, we have narrowed down our marketing to, we have five carriers that do uh, our high rises. We have about eight that do mid rises and we have about four that do garden style. Uh, depending on your property, it's age, it's construction, it's safety and protection. Uh, it can go to several different places. Uh, the big decision makers are the age of your roof. If it's over 20, uh, it goes different places than if it's under 20. Uh, if it's high rise, there are only five carriers that have the limits to put one million, I mean 100 million under one roof. Uh, in most cases, they can't exceed five or 10 million a property. So we know where we're going, who we're dealing with in, in doing so, and my team consists of Alex Medlin, Dan Holt, and Megan Hockett, and all of them uh, have college educations from Tech, UNT, and from uh, Texas A&M. They are professionals and have all been doing this for a minimum of eight years, uh, and they know how to prepare uh, and bid uh, we do the same thing. We have two or three GNL, GL carriers we re rely on. We have one carrier that is pay to complete uh, if you're under 25,000 square foot roof. Uh, past that, we have to construct the program and build the limits. So uh, when you go out to bid, what I suggest is you pick a couple agents. In my case, <coughs> I have one management company where I do it for every client and, and build a, a bid spec with three bids. Uh, we, we go to several markets and we give a market outreach. So when I send you a quote, it's generally going to be three quotes, the best, the medium, and the third, and the differences and the cost differences. So the way we cover it is from soup to nuts. We go from a basic strip down limits. Uh, it's the minimum that you need uh, all the way up to the carriers that like Chubb that come out and really spend the time and the cost associated with it is relative to the service that you get. AFM and Chubb and Great American do a fantastic job for us on property. Uh, we have AmTrust and AmCap that do an outstanding wonderful job for us. McGowan uh, the McGowan Group does a great job for us. Uh, the COVID information that you will be forwarded is Joel. Joel is, leads the DNO practice at McGowan. Uh, so when you go out, we look at the market, see where you are, see where you can go, see what can be fixed, uh, see what can't. Uh, and our goal is to improve it by rate or limit or deductible. Uh, and we're able to do that frequently. Right now, we're having some options. For a while, it was just hold on to your helmet uh, because it's coming down in buckets. But now things are kind of under control. So if you need a bid, it's something one of my guys can counsel you on, uh, give you a list of things you need. Uh, you can check the market, see where you are, make sure you're safe. If you're with AFM, wouldn't hurt to look. If you're with Great American, wouldn't hurt to look. If you're with AmTrust, you're probably safe. Uh, if you're with AmCap, you're perfectly safe. Uh, if you're with McGowan, you're safe. So we have good stable markets once you get over the root shot uh, of the changes, but you will see those changes. They are inevitable. And if I bring them to you or somebody else brings them uh, to you, they, they will be a noticeable difference. So knowing, so knowing that, and thank you for the explanation then. So uh, if, Going to another broker wouldn't necessarily, they could be shopping the same exact 
uh, offerings that you have, correct? They will, they will try, and what we will do in most cases is give you our top five we'd like to use, and if you won't let us have, usually we expect as the incumbent to have three picks. Sure. So the other agents coming in can have the whole market except our three. That's our gotcha. philosophy. You don't have to honor that philosophy, but that's our practice philosophy. And okay. if my guys, uh, if, if that's the way they work and the way they think. Excellent. And Thank so you. that's the way we work it. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, so next question I have is uh, strategies for addressing total insurable value and co-insurance penalties. Okay, the strategy that we engage is a strategy that all boards right now need to engage because I have seen two lawsuits in the last six months filed by associations against their management company and against their insurance agent because the values were out of whack. In one case, uh, we had insured the property for eight years uh, the property had been insured for $18 million for eight years. Uh, suddenly there's a loss and the day after the loss, uh, it is discovered that the property value is 34 million. Well, turned out the board knew, uh, a couple of people on the board knew, the manager knew, uh, but they just didn't think they'd have a very big loss. and. Uh, and they did have a big loss, and when they got ready to rebuild, there just wasn't enough money, and so a lawsuit was filed, and uh, we believe that at the end of the day, we will prevail because we use the values that was sent to us by the board of directors and by uh, the management company. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that can happen. It can happen to, in the best families. Uh, they needed to look at the values. They didn't. Uh, that's something that we're now asking every association we insure to do is look at your values. We have appraiser. They're not appraisers. Replacement cost is new for old, no depreciation, like kind, like quality. It is the reflection of the replacement cost that it would be to put back a building tomorrow. In, in our case, most Oh, mid rises cost about $124 a foot. High rises, 200 to 280. Uh, the number moves all over the, the chart, but we have people that will do a replacement cost survey. Uh, we usually get them done for anywhere from four to about $700. Uh, it may be virtual, it may be an on site visit. If you do that every five years, put it in your file. Uh, as, you, as a board, you're protected, you're good for five years. As a management company, you're good and you're safe and those things will never happen because what happens is a result of not making a decision year after year. So you need to look at it and if you do the quick math in your associations, you know, 40,000 square feet, that value is $60 a square foot, I can tell you right now half of the people are going to be living in the street after the fire. We just got to have enough limits available to rebuild. So uh, that's something that I would caution you. It's a fiduciary responsibility for which you can be sued. And I also forwarded some information uh, which will be made available to you through Nicole. And it is your personal exposure as a board member, because there is a certain amount of exposure beyond the scope of what the DNO covers because anyone can sue you anytime for anything. Consequently, if you carry personal injury on your HO Condo 6 or your homeowners, then your personal lines commercial policy will provide for your service on a volunteer board as long as you're not paid. And in that event, your personal limits are available and so is your personal umbrella. And if you're a high wealth individual, you need to make sure you do that. There's an explanation of that that you can take a quick look at, and I recommend that all board members do so. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next one we have is, uh, so this is, I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but let's see if we can dive a little bit deeper into it. Uh, if the deductible for wind and hail is 1% or 2% of property coverage, right? 
um, mm -hmm. which is a substantial amount of money for most associations. You're talking Correct. about half a million dollars or more. Uh, what, what type of costs are you seeing or rates are you seeing to buy down, to buy that, to buy that rate down? Well, in most cases, we can buy it down to something more reasonable, but sometimes the cure is worse than the, than the disease. Uh, in most cases, and it's my belief, and I've done some research into this, that, a, you know, an association can borrow money. Well, they don't want to, but they can. In the event that a, a board has to take a big deductible, and in the case of, well, I'll give an example. I have one with a seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollar wind and hail deductible. I bought that down for one thirty five. Uh, they didn't take it. It's a big board with a lot of reserves, and and I guess they're just gonna call the bank if they have to fund a deductible of that of that size. I'm not sure how the accountings quite handled on that. On the smaller ones. Uh, what we do is we measure the, the availability against the cost and try to give every association options because you may not be able to budget 150, but you could probably budget 100. You could certainly budget 50 if you have to. Uh, your reserves are available, if not cash. Uh, you know, when a roof needs to be replaced, it needs to be replaced. So, it could be that a, a DNO or that a buy down's not not made for your association. The ones I see not taking it are big high rises with big values. Most of the medium, uh, you get up to forty or fifty million uh, dollar uh, values. We're we're selling them from there down every day. They will take them. They are reasonable. Use just use the rule of thumb of eight percent. If it's a if it's a hundred thousand dollar deductible, you want to buy it down to twenty five. It's going to cost you eight thousand. That's eight percent of the hundred thousand dollar deductible. If it's two hundred, it's going to cost you sixteen at least. Uh, depending on the values, it can cost more or less. Uh, we do have carriers. Uh, Aegis is not sympathetic, uh, whereas we have other carriers that are. So if you are a large property, uh, we do have underwriters that will negotiate on buy downs and make them more palatable. Okay, thank you. So uh, next question. So there, there's, there's some associations out there that are still able to get a, a flat deductible amount on wind and hail, like 25 or 50k, let's say. Are, are you are you seeing this still? Like we, we have a few examples of this, but um, how is that possible? There are some there are some properties that we see that are kind of grandfathered. They've been in the same place a long time with the same carrier, and for some reason, uh, the underwriter likes likes the place. Maybe they used to live there. I mean, there's just no telling. There's not much rhyme or reason to it. Uh, but as far as availability now. AMCAP is at 1%, uh, that's their minimum, and they're one of our best carriers. AmTrust uh, can do away with the wind and uh, all together if they want to. And if it is a high rise that is uh, the right size, then they'll come in, and like I said, I have one uh, down in Turtle Creek I just renewed two weeks ago and another one very near it where we were able to get $75,000 wind deductibles where AFM was offering 2% on renewal. In both those cases, that was, there was just no discussion. There was just, and plus AFM wants at least a 25,000 water uh, because they paid so many water claims and adult diaper claims uh, that uh, they're just not reasonable to deal with on deductibles. So uh, they offer me a 2%. They've been on the property 20 years. Uh, the other property I've written since 1995. So I've uh, written it for 25 years. And in both cases, they just were ready to walk away. 
in both cases, Amtrust came in at the last minute, knocked the water deductible out completely, reduced the wind to 75, and made me very happy and very safe in both, both those cases. But we now have technology so we can measure your roof area uh, with satellites. We take the pictures. Uh, we have the CAD cam to measure, do physical measurements. Uh, we can do an inspection pretty close right up to your windows uh, using our online resources and, uh, and we're able to deal with it in that way. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next, next question. Um, so this is on loss assessment policy endorsements. Could you please speak to using loss assessment policies for all of the unit owners to possibly raise deductibles for wind, hail, and water damage to save money for the associations? Pros and cons. Uh, the pros and cons, there's no con to it. If you have an HO Condo 6, uh, you ought to be carrying, uh, carrying coverage that is, that is uh, commensurate with what, what you need done. In the case of assessments, assessment limits can be raised. If you have an HO Condo 6, they probably throw in, now the parcel lines is not something I practice. I have some associates that do, and I could get you help with it. But uh, under, that, under that coverage, it's yet generally a token limit, 500 or $1,000 limit. You can request from your agent that he raise uh, your coverage under your HO Condo 6, and he'll do it to whatever they have available, and I personally would do that. Uh, because if you ever are assessed by the board and you are called upon, uh, it will fund it up to uh, whatever its limits are. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a very workable uh, coverage, but there has to be an, an, an impaired loss that results uh, in the requirement to do that. It's a legal requirement. And every, everybody in the association should be told that they ought to be carrying coverage uh, on their own policy to protect their own interests uh, in every, every way possible. Perfect, thank you. Uh, next one we have is, are you seeing decreases in deductible or premiums for high rises that might uh, be proactive and install leak detection or some sort of notification such as, uh, or automatic shutoff valves as an example? Are you, seeing, are you seeing the decreases? And if the answer is yes, are they significant enough to offset the installation cost of these devices? Yeah, it, currently it's not. Right now, it it's just wouldn't be worth it because right now, the underwriters are working what they call market, and they're going to go to what the market will bear. During good times and in purse lines, you hear things like student driver discount and early retirement discount and uh, all kinds of credits. The underwriters for high value, what we call HPR, highly protected risks, which you are when you're fully sprinklered, uh, is... Uh, because those things are present in uh, new, new properties. In some cases, they've been retrofit. In most cases, we are all state of the art now. Uh, the security and monitoring is good. So they kind of feel like they're where they need to be. Uh, I have had them work with me uh, to deal with associations that had big changes that had to be made. I've got a big one in Highland Park. And I'm telling you, the Highland Park City of is pushing them to fully sprinkler. Uh, and if they have to fully sprinkler, I've already had to raise their uh, billing and ordinance of law limits to about six million because if they had to retrofit, I got to have limits available that would cover it. And so we had to add six million to their limits. So it's something we look at uh, when we, we do the work. All right. Well, um, I, that's all the questions that have come in. It looks like we have about five minutes left. So, um, Rod, since there's no other questions, if, <clears throat> if maybe to fill this last five minutes, if you have a, a good story, like one that uh, I know you've, you've probably heard and experienced a lot, if there's one that sticks out as to maybe a, like, a, like a something all associations should consider or just a funny, entertaining story you might have, uh, throughout your career. I think that would be good to fill these last few minutes and then we can wrap up. 
Sure, and this is particularly if you're uh, if you are a resident of a high rise. The reason I write high rises is because when I married my blushing bride of 38 years, she was 23 and I was 25, and we spent our honeymoon in Preston Tower on the 23rd floor, and I loved it so much that I came back 10 years later and I wrote Preston Tower and Athena, and I started writing high rises and I wrote them all and seemed like and uh, working with only two management companies by the way and one of them uh, is you and uh, in doing so I've had a Ms. Texas go off the 17th floor of 2016 Main in Houston and I had a stockbroker uh, down at Latour he drank I think they found out that he had been stealing the day before and they were bringing in the security people uh, at the brokerage operation where he worked. And I think he drank till four in the morning uh, before he landed by the pool. And so you are gonna have people from time to time that take uh, the opportunity to solve temporary problems with permanent fixes. When that happens to you, that's when you get on the phone with me and Worth and if something can and needs to be done, it will be done. Uh, I've had to handle these about six times on high rises. I've probably had pool deaths a dozen. Uh, I've had every kind of DNO lawsuit and I've seen every kind of litigation that can ever be had. I've had a high rise call me and say, Rod, come down here, we need to talk to you. And I got there and they said, well, here's what happened at 2 a.m. This guy, Bob up on so on so floor comes in and he's blasted and he broadslides his car into the portico chain. He throws the keys to the concierge and the concierge takes the keys. They put his car up and the bellboy put him on the elevator and took him and put him in his unit, which is a service the concierge will provide at 2 a.m. And 15 minutes later, his girlfriend comes slide, broadsliding in the portico chain. And she comes in and she's screaming and she's mad. And about that time, the elevator opens. Out he comes, buck naked, walking through the foyer with a crowd of people. And I mean to tell you, uh, the things that we do, we fortunately had a really good high rise manager and she talked to the guys. And the guy said, Well, you know, it's going to be awful. And he's a good guy and he gives us turkeys. and and I love him and everybody loved him. And so it went away, uh, but they took him back upstairs, put him in his unit, took her upstairs, put her in his unit, secured the keys. And that's what you gotta do. You just can't allow mayhem to come and go. If it comes, you gotta put it in its, in its place. Uh, we have, have ways of dealing with that. Alex had one down at, was it the beat? Uh, I think it was the beat where they threw the brick through the plate glass window and slept in the uh, reception area on the couch uh, where the police arrested him the next morning. That was New Year's Eve. So we've had every kind of exciting event. I've had, uh, I've had one burn because, uh, because the guy was covering the murder of his wife. I had another one uh, where a fire was started because he accidentally shot a passerby. And he, his defense was it was a, an accident. He, he meant to shoot his wife and he missed and he went through the door and hit a neighbor. So, you know, we've seen any kind of uh, everything. I can tell you in Dallas, this market is wonderful, uh, that this is where I will live. If my ch children ever give me grandchildren, I think I'm going to be in a high rise and I'm going to maintain my parking spot just like a good neighbor should. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that, Rod. That was, that was great. Um, so with that, it's six o'clock. There's no other questions we have. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, thank you, Nicole, for organizing and, in, and extending the invitations. I believe she'll be follow, uh, sending a follow-up after this, probably tomorrow, with the additional information that Rod had mentioned and probably a survey as well. Um, and throughout this, the next couple of months, while everyone is still practicing social distancing, I guess for the foreseeable future, uh, we will be hosting these master speakers virtually. So uh, stay tuned for more invitations to come. But thank you, everybody, for joining tonight. And we'll see you all again soon. Thank you much, Matt. Thank you, Nicole. And to everybody that 
listens. If you have any other questions, drop me an email, give me a call. We're always available. I have a team of five and we can do anything from uh, a meeting of the entire membership to just meeting with you. And we thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Rod. Thank you.